Uh, okay, so hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded center for mesoscale mapping housed in the Martino Center. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Melanie Bolli. Dr. Bolli is a neurologist and a neuroscientist with a joint appointment in neurology and psychiatry. Her research aims at combining neuroimaging techniques such as PET, functional MRI, TMS EEG, and high density EEG to a theoretical framework, the integrated information theory of consciousness, where she hopes to uncover the neural mechanisms of the level of consciousness in healthy subjects and neurological patients. Her work has led to more than 150 publications in international peer-reviewed journals, and she's also an associate editor of the journals Neuroimage, Frontiers in Consciousness Research, Frontiers in Brain Imaging Method, and Neuroscience of Consciousness. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have using the Q&A box or raise your hand. Dr. Bolli, thank you so much for coming here today. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, uh, as the uh, or uh, gently uh, kindly introduced, I'm a neurologist and I work on, on consciousness since a while. I work on theory too, but I'm not going to show any theory today. I wanted to have a data focused talk and, uh, you know, showing you some stuff that we know neurologists like to do is integrate the picture between uh, data obtained uh, from lesion studies, stimulation, studies in patients and recording studies in normal, uh, normal subjects and normal typical subjects. And the topic of my talk is the neural codes of consciousness. So first, let me say how we define neural codes of consciousness uh, and also how we define consciousness as an object of scientific study. Uh, consciousness, as I talk about here, is subjective experience to what it is like, for example, to perceive a scene and your pain to entertain a thought or to reflect on the experience itself. And when consciousness fades, as it does during dreamless sleep, from the intrinsic perspective of the experiencing subject, the entire world vanishes. So in the 19s, uh, Christoph Koch and Francis Crick have uh, introduced a pragmatic approach to, um, to study consciousness and the links with the brain, which was uh, the notion of neural correlates of consciousness. But my NCC, we mean more than correlation. The definition is that uh, these are the, the minimal neuronal mechanism jointly sufficient for any one conscious perception. For every conscious percept, there will be an NCC. Inducing it will induce the perception. Inactivating it will eliminate it. So it's really a causal role. Huh? Uh, in consciousness studies, there are two different ways uh, you can actually uh, study consciousness. There's a global approach and a content specific approach. They are very complementary, but very different. The global approach is uh, you try to find what are the minimum prerequisite for brain activity uh, for someone to be conscious of any content, but being conscious as a state, you contrast conscious versus unconscious states. And then there's a content specific approach, which is a different question because there, the content, uh, the, the, the prerequisite for uh, being conscious already met. But then you look at uh, how come that you actually are, are conscious of one particle of content versus another one. So you contrast states where you're conscious anyway already, but a specific content is present versus absent. And there has been a lot of progress in the different, uh, uh, in the last few days, uh, trying to develop some paradigms like masking, binocular rivalry, or, or you know, uh, continuous flash, flash repression where you try to match physical characteristics of the stimuli. And then also in recent years, people have, uh, and I'll talk more about this, have realized that there's also, it's important to check for neural correlates of, of conscious contents within tasks, but also we shouldn't ignore the spontaneous experiences we have, like in dreams or meditation studies, for example, and there's a lot of useful information we can get out of them, especially dissociating consciousness from task performance per se. So I'll talk more about this, but these are all different aspects. And the important thing to, to, to get in mind is, these are two different questions. The global approach is to try to look at what is necessary for being conscious as a state. And in the content specific approach, you're already conscious, but then you have different contents and you look at what is the prerequisite for, for that. Yeah? And then it's also nice to have a reflection about the different kind of data we have. And here is, of course, the point of view of a neurologist, but I think a lot of people would agree that lesion studies are quite powerful. In some cases, you know, they can really 
they provoke because they're cool, cool, yeah. So like if there is lesion or focal areas of the brain and you see some changes in consciousness, it can uh, provide strong evidence for a given structure to be necessary. Sometimes you have re reorganization issues, you know, in the long run, but still these are, I'll show some examples to you how powerful these can be. And then stimulation studies like direct electrical stimulation, we do, I'm an epileptologist now in, here in the US and uh, we do a lot of these direct electrical stimulation for brain mapping. So these also are perturbational, um, you know, uh, studies and you can have uh, very specific effects that can be very informative sometimes. Now, if you have the same effect everywhere in the brain then it's less informative, that's more like a network effect, but it can be really useful. And then importantly, like recording and there, and there I mean, for example, single unit recording, intracranial recording or neuroimaging like a fMRI. These are very important because then you're, you're not studying patient, you're studying normal typical subjects, but they are more correlational. And their meta-analysis really helps like actually trying to look at a lot of different conditions and look from there, distill the neural quality of consciousness from prerequisite consequences, task performance, and all that, uh, to really look at what is predictive of particular content across different states. And I'll talk more of that again. So these three different type of evidence is what I'm going to show you a brief overview today. I gave you the PDF because I'm citing a lot of studies and you could go back and see each of them. But to show you that actually it's a very interesting to do this exercise because the consistent picture seems to emerge from them. Um, and so, you know, consciousness is a broad topic. You could have different ways to approach it. And uh, it's good to kind of have, a, you know, like a, some kind of a core or like theme, you know, to kind of guide you through. So one of the contrasts we have found useful in the community over the last few years is actually looking at, you know, uh, the role of the say prefrontal cortex versus posterior cortex in consciousness. There has been a lot of debate about this and lesion studies, simulation studies, imaging studies have actually shown some interesting results um, and also some interesting methodological, you know, uh, issues to, 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 to talk about. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I could talk about the left, the right, the midline, the lateral, but here I'll focus on that question uh, as an example on how, you know, how to integrate the picture together. So the lesion evidence, what is the lesion evidence for, say, the front versus the back of conscious, uh, of the brain and the role in consciousness? Well, so actually there, they have been in the 1940s and 30s and 40s in particular, a lot of studies in humans and animals uh, that were questioning the role of frontal lobe at all, um, especially well in uh, intellectual function and in consciousness. And the reason is that there were some example of patients like here, a patient with, um, with epilepsy operated by Penfield where there was a, a huge resection of the, basically most of the prefrontal cortex and the patient's IQ improved postoperatively, never lost consciousness. And then some other patient uh, from Brickner who actually wrote a whole book to say, no, no, the frontal lobe is useful for something. Look, my patient has some issues. He was conscious though. So uh, this patient had the whole, uh, virtually the whole prefrontal cortex removed except for uh, Broca um, and, uh, and area six, which is premotor cortex. And that patient never lost consciousness despite this resection. And toward the Neurological Institute in New York, in a party of five, two of them being neurologists, and none of them noticed anything unusual for more than an hour. So these type of studies have like show, show some uh, powerful evidence that you don't need a prefrontal cortex to be con conscious. Now, also it studies humans, so people have objected. Maybe it's not the complete resection of the frontal lobe. What do you know? Maybe there's a little left. So actually, these studies were complemented by some studies in animals, but these are all the cases in humans that I skip for the sake of time. Whatever you recite, you don't lose consciousness. Yeah. So there are some studies in monkeys, for example, and also some studies in cats where they explicitly removed, again, in that um, same debate, what is the frontal lobe for, you know, they actually removed or isolated by lobotomy, the whole prefrontal cortex documented by histology in macaques. And these um, monkeys never lost consciousness. One was, okay, more aggressive. He had a tendency to steal from his peers. The other ones uh, were actually able to problem solve, uh, you know, some opening boxes and shape discriminations, things that in humans, to be able to do that, you need to be conscious. So these are powerful evidence from lesion studies that you do not need a prefrontal cortex for being conscious as a state. And it contrasts with the evidence that we have for the back of the brain. So if you have some 
And there is much more studies to be done, including some newer studies that are starting to appear. But there is some contrast in the fact that if you have some large uh, lesions of here, for example, the posterior corpus callosum and surrounding white matters, patients never recover from coma. If you have in this paper, they say corpus callosum, but it's mostly posterior. If you have lesions like this, you have 214 chances to never recover, more chances to never recover from coma. Brainstem is only seven. That's so it's a powerful effect. And also there is some emerging literature in anoxic brain injury, some case reports, you know, in the literature, also some cases that I saw suggesting that if you have lesions, restricted anoxic lesions, so diffusion restriction in a posterior part of the brain, you never recover. And there are several studies, more than these were just two nice studies um, that have uh, replicated the same results too, that if you try to look at what are the regions that are best predictive for recovery from anoxic brain injury, Actually, most of the signal in you know, occipital and parietal lobe. If you compare uh, um, for the cortical, and there's a, a little bit more in the basal, basal ganglia too, but in, within the cortex, um, actually, occipital and parietal lobe, if you keep them alone, it's better than a model including the frontal cortex to predict uh, predict recovery. And that's also just that study, I believe it from you guys, from MGH or so, has been involved. Um, that just appeared in the uh confirming this, suggesting that say here, if you take the uh, signal in the occipital lobe only, you have a better model of recovery than if you take the whole brain or the whole cortex and they even cite us kindly saying that it suggests that the, the, the posterior cortex is actually uh, most important for consciousness, yeah? So if you look at the studies, lesion studies, some older, some newer, more to be done, but there is a contrast uh, there seems to be some convincing evidence that you do not need a prefrontal cortex for being conscious, but that large posterior brain lesions actually predict permanent coma or vegetative state. So that was for the global approach. Now, what about the content specific approach? One could argue, okay, maybe you don't need a prefrontal cortex to be conscious, but maybe it's involved in some contents there. The question is still open. Um, but uh, there is also a contrast. Uh, if you look at content specific, uh, you know, changes in consciousness, the closest we have in neurology is actually agnosia. So you leave a piece of understanding of the world and typically it goes with anosognosia, which is like you don't even know you have a problem because you just don't know what that particular thing is anymore. There are many of them. You can have cortical blindness, cortical deafness, prosopagnosia, achromatopsia, visual form agnosia. In the cases where this has been documented, if they are complete, typically these agnosias go with full ignorance of your symptoms. Say so vernicae, posterior, especially in the posterior part of the brain, not everyone. So broca, you notice it, patients are upset, but vernicae, you lose comprehension of speech. And patients typically are very happy, they don't know uh, they have a problem. And then you have, see, like many different ones, you can have problem with calculus, problem with the, coordination and all this. If you map these, again, more to be done, but the, the current kind of understanding is if you map all these agnosias, the content specific changes in consciousness, you see that overwhelmingly they come from the posterior part of the brain. And again, that's kind of posterior from in the back, yeah? Now it's not that the prefrontal cortex doesn't, uh, lesions don't need to specific syndrome. They're actually very nice papers, uh, you know, describing them, that if you have actually lesion of different parts of the uh, frontal cortex, you can have impairment in some tasks and, or of course, emotional regulation. An interesting one, metacognition, an interesting one is the medial prefrontal cortex where, can, where you can have some kind of akinetic mutism. So you, can, you cannot initiate spontaneous actions, but you're still conscious, like a patient I had like this, she actually was conscious of, uh, like with the stroke yeah, of the medial prefrontal cortex, she was conscious of what was uh, around her. She, she could remember after TPA, she recovered, she could tell me actually what she remembered, but she just couldn't initiate any, any action she was staring, yeah? And so there's a contrast here, instead of um, having consequences on the contents of consciousness, it seems the more it's like, uh, you know, this kind of task related and or metacognition related, uh, re related, um, the facts, their deficits. And it's thought to be that after, at, in that paper, they suggest that maybe this is related to the fact that the frontal cortex, most of it, except for frontal pulse, might be more modular and functioning with some cortical subcortical loops with the basal ganglia. We don't know yet. But just saying again that if you look at the contents of consciousness, the question is still open. We need to look at experience, you know, doing tasks 
in all this uh, in these patients is much more to do. Uh, but there seems to be a contrast again where the, the evidence for deficits in consciousness is much stronger for the back of the brain. Okay. So that was kind of a quick brush of the evidence uh, we have from lesion. There's much more to be said, uh, but uh, just to give you a flavor that, you know, it's not that every part of the brain has the same consequences when you lesion it. There's much more evidence for uh, both the global being conscious this is not, um, and then for the constant specific deficits to be uh, located in the back of the brain. Uh, stimulation evidence is also very uh, informative for consciousness because you can stimulate different parts of the brain, say for brain mapping, and then patients tell you, oh, I feel this or I feel that or not. Yeah. Um, now, it's actually uh, something that has uh, shown much more uh, results for the contents of consciousness, not so much for the global approach. So basically, for being conscious versus not. The best evidence you have is, for example, you can wake up animals from sleep or anesthesia using stimulation in the brain stem to cite also this uh, very nice study from Paul Blumenfeld's group where they wake up looking at the thalamus and, and brain stem stimulation, the same spots in every animal. They can wake up animals from seizure, anesthesia, and sleep. As you may know, this, uh, this is leading now to clinical trials, but that's more like for subcortical centers, for the, the, the uh, cortex, we, we just don't know yet. Um, but for the contents of consciousness, it's much more known. From the beautiful early studies of Penfield and Jasper to more recent results, there seems to be a contrast again, that if you stimulate many different parts of the posterior brain, you have many different changes, so, uh, like uh, some paresthesia, some sort of, like change in sensation, motor intention or sounds if you stimulate the back. But most of the frontal cortex is experienced shyly silent, meaning you can have some twitches or movements, but it won't change the way you, you feel. It won't change contents of consciousness. So that's like one review, but there are many more studies suggesting, for example, you can stimulate the fusiform face area on one side and you have hallucinate faces. Another study replicating the results where if you stimulate some areas, the patient hallucinates faces. If you stimulate other areas, the patient I hallucinate rainbows, yeah. very specific changes for different places in the back of the brain. Phosphines from visual areas, visual motion in an area close to MT, out of body experiences from the right temporal junction, and then auditory hallucination from the superior temporal cortex. A very nice paper uh, from uh, Dr. Pavizi recently showing changing bodily self with an impression of floating in space, but your body doesn't belong to you anymore. Um, uh, when stimulating the posterior cingulate cortex. So a lot of different uh, changes in uh, the contents of consciousness from stimulation of posterior areas. So what about the front of the brain? Well, there, the best evidence we have is stimulation of the anterior cingulate cortex. There are two different studies suggesting that you can, and I had a patient myself too, I, I saw that, uh, where you can have intrusive thoughts. So switching the thoughts, the contents of the thoughts when you stimulate the posterior part of the interior cingulate cortex and also like a will to persevere. So this is the best evidence we have from the posterior part of the interior cingulate that you can have this kind of change in abstract like thoughts, yeah? There were some studies suggesting that you can have complex hallucinations by stimulating the frontal lobe at different places, hallucinations that were not really specific in their contents. But if you look at the older literature, actually complex hallucinations are much more frequently elicited from temporal lobe. That's also like these dream states where you have during temporal lobe seizures. So there it's more to me like a network effect. You don't know if the, it's more like the whole brain is like involved in this kind of complex phenomena. Yeah? Uh, but again, more to be done about this. There was a very, very nice uh, recent uh, meta-analysis by Dr. Pavizi and Dr. Fox in Nature uh, Human Behavior, uh, where they had um, 67 patients, 1,500 electrodes, and they looked to that in which areas you had responses change in consciousness. You can see that heat map um, in, the, in the back here, showing again this contrast that you have many more areas that are eloquent and higher response rate posterior brain areas, also seeing that a single cortex I was mentioning, the posterior part, but not so much uh, in, uh, in the front of the brain. So a consistent picture is emerging there. Contrast, same net for lesions, and for the contents of consciousness, and uh, also for from lesions, that you don't need a prefrontal cortex to be conscious. There is, um, you know, much more evidence for 
the lesions or stimulation in the back of the brain um, to actually um, be involved in different concepts of consciousness, not so much for the front. The question again is open, but there's a contrast there. So that was my quick uh, summary, you know, of these uh, lesion and stimulation studies, again, taking the front versus back angle as an example, but I hope to show you that the picture seems to be consistent between the two, that both lesion and stimulation studies suggest that uh, there is much more, uh, you know, many more different concepts of consciousness that seems to be specified in the back. And in the case of the lesion studies that the posterior brain lesions have much more consequences on consciousness, at least as far as we know. What about neuroimaging? Neuroimaging is extremely important, of course, because uh, you know we want to um, do studies not only in patients' brains, in epileptic brains, or patients with lesions. We also want to have a, a coherent picture, um, including in normal typical subjects, right? Uh, the tricky part was neuroimaging, um, and I think that's something that has been more and more discussed in the cognitive neuroscience too is that you design your task, your experiment as best as you can, but you might have broader, uh, broader activations than the areas that may be uh, you know, causally involved. Um, and so an example here, I didn't completely comment this uh, picture, but what you have here in this picture uh, from the Agendotipavisis group is the only uh, uh, region that the most consistent, you know, actually across many patient, um, you know, uh, area that elicit faces for uh, by direct electrical stimulation is the right more than the left um, physiform face area. In this, are, it, in this patient, it's actually right only, yeah? But if you look at high frequency uh, responses in the intracranial EEG to faces versus scrubber faces, or if you do a fMRI signal, you actually find a broader significant response. Uh, that there is actually a network of areas that actually is um, broader than the areas that seem to be most causally involved in there. Yeah. Uh, now, so that's where like the reflection comes on how how can we distill what are you know these kind of mechanisms that are really the core mechanisms involved. Yeah. And there, I discussed that briefly, and I mean it also uh, comes from Russ Poldrax and others. You know, there's reflection on on uh, um, you know. Um, um, the, how, how to kind of try to look at specificity in your imaging. So one important approach here is actually to search for conditions dissociating, say, consciousness from responsiveness or task performance. So look at what is important for the contents of consciousness to say uh, versus, uh, you know, like the task, particular task involved. And all like in the case of, uh, in the case of, say, sleep dreams, <laughs> you know, when you are asleep, you might be conscious or not, but actually you're consistently unresponsive and you need to be careful and dissociating the two, dissociating responsiveness from consciousness. So if you're dreaming, you have an experience, but you, you're unresponsive. And so you need to actually take the two into account. And same for, uh, you know, these kind of task, um, task uh, related confirmation for the contents of consciousness. And then once you have done many of these experiments where you dissociate consciousness from consequences, for example, you could look at meta-analysis. Um, and their reverse inference would be the most specific. I, I could mention that, but but then also it's important to go beyond. And once you have a candidate NCC, look at this prospective prediction approach, try to predict online, um, both like what would make you conscious or not, and then um, you know, and then and then also what would predict specific contents of consciousness. So these three different approaches can be used, yeah, to try to look critically, not only at one experiment, but across many experiments to, to distill, as uh, uh, Dr. Meloni would say, distill the neural qualities of consciousness from its consequences, yeah. And so now looking at the global approach, yeah, so looking at being conscious versus not, uh, there you actually really want to have an explicit ref a reflection about this. So consciousness can be formally assessed by having subjective reports uh, of the subjects telling you, yes, I was unresponsive, but I was, say, for example, dreaming or I was conscious or not. Um, behavior is not enough. Uh, we have had many, uh, many different examples now in anesthesia or in coma or, you know, in sleep, it's like the hallmark of it where you can be actually unresponsive but conscious. The first studies that actually studied consciousness in sleep or anesthesia only looked at, at responsiveness as a criteria for for loss of consciousness, yeah? So comparing sleep to wake, 
you get this frontal parietal network on the both sides, medial lateral, yeah, and anesthesia to wake, also the same thing. But here you're actually mixing the two while during sleep. Now we know in most of the time you're actually conscious during sleep. So it's not really a good model of consciousness during anesthesia. My dream or not, but you also have the lots of responsiveness coming up, yeah? And so you're kind of mixing the two and what you want to do is try to distill, uh, to dissociate consciousness from responsiveness because if they dissociate, it means they rely on different mechanisms and you want to understand them, right? So that's where, you know, we came up also recently with uh, Giulio Tononi, Francesca Saclari, with that kind of within state paradigm, as we call it, where you look at during, within sleep, subjects are unresponsive, so you discard components of that, and you look at periods where they're conscious versus not within the same behavioral state. So in non-REM sleep, if you wake up subjects during the night, you see that they actually are unconscious, no conscious experience NCE on your third of the time, even during deep sleep. They are conscious two thirds of the time, and, and one third they recall the same, that, 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 sorry, in one third they recall the full dream, in about one third, they are sure they were conscious, but they don't know what. Interestingly, in REM sleep, you're conscious 95% of the time, but there are 5% of the time where subjects said they were unconscious as well. If you contrast within these states, what is the difference between consciousness uh, versus no consciousness, you actually can uh, really distill uh, what are the core areas that make a difference, right? And so that's what we found here, a very different results from that frontal parietal network from before, right? If you contrast conscious versus unconscious peers during sleep, you find that the areas that make a difference is, are actually in a posterior hot zone in the back of the brain. So you have more delta power in this parietal temporal occipital areas. If you are unconscious during non sleep compared to when you're conscious, and importantly, it's the same, um, same zone that you find, same posterior hot zone is found when you contrast conscious versus unconscious REM sleep, which is very different neurophysiologically. So this is actually um, showing you that the devil is in the details in consciousness science too. If you mix consciousness and responsiveness, you'll find like the whole brain makes a difference. And we're really trying to move now into dissociating consciousness from its consequences. Same thing in, um, in coma science now, there's a more realization too that uh, the contrast, you know, if, well, okay, let's take that picture. If you take patients in a vegetative state, so show no signs of behavioral consciousness and, uh, and compare them to controls, you'll find that the whole brain is different. But if you take patients that are more matched to them in terms of responsiveness, so minimally conscious states, they have actually more signs of consciousness, but are poorly responsive. So in these patients, the difference between the two is more localized to the back of the brain. The areas here in red show more metabolism in minimally conscious state versus vegetative state. Same like in connectivity, you have different studies showing that, same for EEG. So there's some consistent results now showing that, or like within the same patient, when they recover before versus after they recover consciousness, that's also the nice match, yeah? If you try to discard confounds due to responsiveness of like some brain lesions, you actually find more consistent change in the back there too. Yeah, so that's kind of an emerging picture also for neuroimaging. If you take that dissociation approach and you try to discard confounds due to changes in responsiveness, you find that both in sleep and coma, uh, you have uh, not the whole brain makes the most difference, but the, actually if you really target consciousness, you find most of the signal of interest in posterior brain areas. Um, and then, you can play the same game in a way or like apply the same methods, you know, to dissociate consciousness from task performance for the contents of consciousness. Again, it's a different question. You're already conscious, so you met that, but then you want to see what are the, the content specific changes for one particular, say perceiving a phase versus an object or that, yeah? And so here, the first studies we're actually targeting detection tasks. I did some of them myself too, where we were, you know, we were kind of learning. So we were showing some stimuli and subjects had to respond, did you see it or not? Yeah, it was a task-based paradigm. And what you found is when you were seeing words compared to not seeing the words, you have more activity in the back of the brain, but also in a large frontal parietal network of areas, yeah? But then here again, you're mixing consciousness and task performance. So there are new over the last kind of decade and a half, I think it was like progressively increasing number of experiments that tried to find some smart ways to again, kind of, you know, I would say deconvolve, like separate, di di dissociate the two. So you can really focus on changes in consciousness independent of task performance. And when you do that, so they were like different things, like not only looking at target, but also non-target task irrelevant stimuli, 
if you look at say countries versus unconscious for the targets, you find um, that there is some different uh, signal kind of more in the, both in the front and the back of the brain. But if you look at non-targets and what matters for consciousness really is only in the back, yeah? And so if you take the union of the two, what is the most consistent NCC, it's signal in the back of the brain. And so non-target, and same here, task irrelevant stimuli. If you are aware of a task irrelevant, stimul uh, task irrelevant stimulus, the signal is mostly located in the back of the brain, but the task irrelevant, it involves a lot more the frontal areas. Same in fMRI, task irrelevant stimuli or like EG2, uh, visible versus invisible, you find some differences mostly posteriorly and also in connectivity posteriorly. Binocular rivalry paradigm there, it's also like a matter of the complexity of the task. If you give a task that is super difficult to subjects, you'll have a lot of recruitment of the, the task, uh, sorry, the attentional areas. But if you give a task that is simpler, you'll see that what, what actually follows concepts of consciousness. Uh, is most in back of the brain, or you also decide to do a no report paradigm. See, there are many different <laughs> like kind of lines of evidence coming from di different tricks to try to separate consciousness from tasks. So, no report paradigm is like if you see the lines are moving this way or that way, actually, you can show that the way your eyes are moving follows your perception. And so, you actually use the eye movements as a proxy for report. Well, if you do that, if you follow the eye movements rather than having a, an explicit response, again, a lot of frontal areas disappear, yeah? And then you can also look at explicit modulation by say the task relevance versus the content specific changes. So like the identity of the stimulus you see. And again, you see that like in yellow is the mostly modulated by task. You see a lot of frontal areas that's like a flat map, yeah? So frontal areas are mostly modulated by task. But then if you look at the selectivity for different kind of stimuli that follow your conscious perception, it's like more in the back. So again, the same kind of story in a lot of different lines of evidence suggesting that, you know, ask, there's a lot of evidence for frontal cortex to be involved in task relevance. But if you look at, again, that contrast is much more evidence for posterior brain areas to be involved in constant specific changes. And also dreams, um, as I mentioned, spontaneous experiences are understudied and have to be combined with the rest of the evidence if you really want to, talk, to challenge NCC. Uh, you know, sleep dreams are actually a perfect condition to dissociate consciousness from, from task relevance. There's no task, they are subjects wake up from sleep and then they are asked, were you dreaming of, what the word were you dreaming about? Were you dreaming of faces versus not? For example, if they say to you, Yes, I was dreaming of faces. You find increased gamma activity during REM sleep, yeah, in um, areas close to the fusiform phase areas. If they were dreaming of spatial settings, you find right parietal cortex activation. If they were dreaming of moving, you find an area close to MT. And if you find a uh, speech, it's actually an area close to Wernicke. Again, a lot of different areas of the back of the brain may be most involved and not so much evidence from the front, yeah. And then uh, fitting nicely with the simulation studies, we had also a study about spontaneous thought in wakefulness and sleep. And if you look at the overlap between the three of them, you find that spontaneous thoughts uh, are related to more activation in the stimulated cortex. So exactly where when you stimulate with electrical stimulation, you find some changes. So overall, again, we get to the same picture than for the concepts of consciousness, which I find very exciting. If you Look at uh, you know the devil in the details again. You try to uh, to account for uh, compounds due to responsiveness on the left or task performance on the right. Yeah, in different ways, you find that uh, a consistent picture is emerging, and it's also consistent with electrical stimulation or lesion studies that uh, you know the most of the content uh, specific uh, information on the right, but also like the information about being conscious versus not. So the global and content specific approach. Uh, most of the evidence for involvement in either being conscious or for context of consciousness is actually uh, in the back of the brain, uh, not so much evidence for the front. Yeah? Again, more to be done, but this is kind of a mini revolution we have in our field, uh, which I find very healthy and very exciting. Anyway, so we suggested that uh, maybe the picture would be like this, uh, if you had to summarize this, that, that most of the evidence is actually for the different for both being conscious or the full NCC is like basically when you're conscious this is not uh, the evidence for this in, in, in orange. Yeah, it's for the back of the brain. And maybe what's happening is you have that part of the brain being more, and we don't know exactly where the borders are yet. Yeah, but something more posterior, um, more likely excluding the anterior third of the frontal lobe. Yeah, but uh, 
uh, within this area that is important for being conscious, then you have different specialized areas that are involved in different contents. So there could be some low level contents like edges, like V1, V2, uh, and then higher level content like places or faces. Yeah? Um, there can be some thought content of different kinds. So basically there would be an overlap between the areas that are important for being conscious and then the specialized, uh, you know, different areas that are within it as specifying different contents. Now, these areas interact yeah, with like say, the neural non activating system in the brainstem like prerequisite. And then also the, with the scan of big computer with in the front for like motor report for actions for, you know, verbal report and this kind of, cognitive loops like attention, working memory that are not content specific, they can be applied to any content, yeah? Uh, but so that would be a, like a kind of picture. I didn't put it here, but that very interesting. I found at least two modeling papers suggesting that this kind of architecture would be highly adaptive. That actually having like an identification machine, the first layer, yeah, <laughs> possibly in the back of the brain, uh, coupled with some very flexible computing system in the front that would be less content specific, would be highly adaptive because you, you can recognize many items, but then you have a lot of, flexibility in, in your actions in there. So that's possibly like what, what we think maybe might be going on, but I'm going to be challenged, but that's like how we would interpret the picture we see um, anyway. And then if you want to further challenge your NCC, you want to use a prospective prediction approach. You want to look at single trial, right? Uh, and so uh, for example, can your NCC predict the presence versus absence of consciousness or specific contents, right? So we had done that, you know, with that posterior hot zone uh, question. Uh, we had not only like post hoc kind of analysis on, on a group of subjects in non-REM sleep and REM sleep, we also challenged that online. So Ben Baer did that. He took the signal from a few electrodes only in the back of the brain and tried to predict online if subjects would be conscious or not during uh, non-REM sleep. And basically taking the delta power and the beta power, a combination of the two saying if you have low delta power and high beta power, you're going to be conscious. If you have high delta power, low beta power, you're going to be unconscious. And this worked pretty well, you know, for just a few channels in the back of the brain, you had an accuracy of a 85% at a single trial level. And again, post analysis showed the most predictive areas were in the back of the brain. Yeah. So, and then for the contents of consciousness, oh, well, that's also saying, if you look at the classification studies in coma, and I mean, I showed you also the anoxic brain injury in a way, it's, it's like this, but um, it looks like, again, the most predictive signal are more in posterior sensory areas, including visual context, both in like PET scan or fMRI connectivity. And then we saw the diffusion uh, studies, uh, restricted diffusion study for anoxia, right? So consistent picture of a good prediction of being conscious versus not in back. And then there are some interesting different studies also about the contents of consciousness. So one study from Brad Polster's group, and then one study uh, from um, Christopher et al. Um, from the Heinz group, where they looked at you know, working memory tasks. And basically, if you look at the sample, which is when you see the stimuli, this is the areas here in green. And then the delay, which are the areas that are involved in, during the, the, the maintenance of the working memory. If you try to decode from these different ROIs, the identity of the stimulus, you find that these posterior areas in green here are much more um, informative. And actually the visual areas in MT much more, but the, 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 for example, the parietal cortex or the frontal areas you don't find much in there. And that's another study here, again, with visual versus frontal parietal areas showing that only in the visual areas, you find a di significant difference between attended and unattended memory item, which is the difference between conscious versus unconscious ones, yeah? So these areas in the back of the brain are again for these decoding studies uh, seem to be having the most power in there. Anyway, just fitting with that picture. And I, I'll, I think I'll just skip this, yeah. Um, and then just a, a, a warning about decoding studies. Uh, it's related, basically, well, maybe I'll just, if I have time, say that. It's related to this kind of, uh, forward versus reverse inference problem in a way. Yeah? So if you do a meta-analysis of different studies uh, that show what is activated uh, for faces, you find the basically the face network and then some frontal parietal areas. If you look at what is specific for faces, you find mostly the fusiform, some amygdala. Yeah? For consciousness, it's not adaptive yet, but same for decoding. I mean, if you decode from some areas, 
it's very important to be content specific and look at what is specific for that particular content versus the other. So it has to generalize across a lot of different conditions. But just finding decoding in an area, it might not be sufficient to have it causally involved. And that's where maybe encoding models. I'm not an expert, but that's kind of what I, you know, I feel is a, it has to be kind of more and more. So through is like encoding models to predict which permissions are required for contents might be uh, even more informative, like also this rep representation of similar, uh, similarity analysis. That's of note, a discussion we have a lot in these, uh, we have some, uh, um, some big experiments going on between uh, different countries uh, trying to test, for example, the predictions of integrated information theory versus global workspace. Yeah. And we have some decoding analysis and we have all these kind of methods questions about what is the most appropriate studies to find out the NCC. Yeah? So these are really practical questions and the representation of similarity analysis is a very promising one because you look across a lot of different conditions and looking at this kind of a representational um, structures, right? So, so basically, you know, uh, I think where if I had to say interim conclusions, uh, it's like 20 plus years now, I studied when I was a baby, basically in medical school, but I'm doing consciousness research and a lot has changed. It's very exciting because I think we're facing the same kind of challenge in learnings and in the uh, bigger community in neuroimaging about really thinking about your methods and the devil is in the details and you really need to be as careful as you can in a first, like, you know, um, discarding your obvious compounds, doing these dissociation studies, looking at behavior versus subjective experience. Uh, as two different things, complementary, interestingly complementary, but two different things, yeah. And um, and then also uh, having this broad view of not only looking in one condition, but trying to do some smart way of doing meta-analysis, both you know across patients and normal subjects, and also within neuroimaging across tasks, no tasks. But I'm really pushing to mechanistic approaches, right? To uh, this kind of uh, integrative approaches, as I tried to show you. So if I had to say now what I would conclude of what I showed, um, it's very important, and we learned how important it is, you know, to distill the neural qualities of consciousness from both their prerequisites, activating systems, and the consequences, motor verbal outputs, or cognitive processes. I didn't mention we take activating systems like the brain somehow as a prerequisite because sometimes it can be dissociations. Like say during deep non-REM sleep, your brain stem is virtually inactive, but still in about even like stage three sleep and deep sleep, in about half of the time you can dream. And it's kind of interesting actually to uh, push more of this, but the consequences is where more effort has been pushed for good reasons, uh, because it's, it's pervading. You know, consciousness is involved in so many things. Uh, so uh, dissociating the, the, these prerequisite and consequences is crucial to understand the mechanisms, right? Because if they can dissociate, it means these are different uh, mechanisms underlying them, right? And uh, what is very inspiring and see all is see all these different promising methods that people are finding to do so, right? So there is like no task, task irrelevant. There is like this modulation by task versus specificity, this prediction approaches. So complementary and useful to challenge your theories, yeah, to, to use all these. So I tried to show you, and I'm happy to <laughs> take any questions on tomatoes after this, but that lesion stimulation recording studies are very implemented. And um, they provide evidence that many of the areas contributing to specific contexts of experience are located in the pussy horizon at the back of the brain. Uh, evidence of the prefrontal cortex for the contents in particular is still open, uh, but there's still a lot to do. So we need more detailed lesion and simulation studies in particular with the, you know, the progress in uh, neuroanatomy, neuroimaging we have now, and also like quantifying more systematically subjective experiences in neurological and neurosurgical patients. Also looking at not only the deficits in say task performance, also what kind of concepts are missing with what they understand of their deficit at the endosognosia uh, part, yeah. Within state, no report, no task paradigms. Uh, as I mentioned, these are very promising uh, and we have to do more of them for different contents to kind of understand what is really at the core. Yeah, like this distilling approach. Um, and then combination of dissociation approach, meta-analysis and prospective prediction approach. So you try to dissociate consciousness from its consequences, say, and then do a meta-analysis to find out, like say using refer uh, reverse inference or similar approaches 
find out what is really the most specific, what's at the core of it. And then prospective prediction approach, really try to look at single trial accuracy yeah, to validate the NCC, both for the global approach, so being conscious of this not, and that's implication are important also for coma patients, as you may know, and also for content specific changes, uh, both like recording on your imaging studies. Interestingly, also there's more literature coming with multi uh, kind of level combination also in patients. So that's like one patient from a privacy group again, uh, where they stimulated the visual cortex, retinopathy yeah, stimulation, and they showed that the maximum response to gamma pore in uh, intracranial response was, was at one location, the same location. If you stimulate it, you find, you know, that hallucination of uh, visual phosphines, yeah. And then if you do fMRI, the response is also maximum there. So like a good consistency between your imaging of different modalities, and 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 stimulation, for example, in the same subject. And then it's the same thing here. Another study where that fusiform phase area on the right, uh, that's the maximum of response in F1 here, uh, the maximum response to uh, the fMRI, to frequency tagging in the intracranial EEG, yeah? But also this is the only area where if you stimulate it, you have um, a consistent response. So basically this suggests that you can also in patients use neuroimaging studies to inform your priors to where to stimulate if you can. And, it's a, it's a very, uh, for, for me, it's a very promising program to uh, combine, explicitly combine the different approaches. And yeah, so, you know, in principle, neural correlate is actually, you know, what if the term the, that doesn't give it justice, it's actually more like the mechanisms, the core mechanisms we want to find. And as such, they should survive dissociation, association and predictive prediction approaches, yeah? And they should also be consistent between lesion simulation and recording studies. Which is really cool because sorry for the numbers like one two one two, <laughs> which is really cool because I really need, need to talk to each other. It's like a group effort, uh, but there is to me a lot of hope doing this. so. I just show you the front of the back of the brain as like one big you know contrast, but there seems to be very, a lot of information there, right? And we, we have many more things to do together. Um, and again, also what is exciting uh, in the field is uh, not only we're doing more and I hope better experimental work, but there is an emergence of different scientific theories of consciousness. And the ones that, uh, you know, they should really also be clear about what they define. I'm talking about a, a theory of consciousness as subjective experience is what we want, yeah. And we want these to actually also help us integrate between the different, um, the different modalities and, uh, and try to uh, find an explanation empirical finding and some predictions we can. And it's where, as I was mentioning, these big consortium studies, there are four of them now, comparing, say, integrated information theory to global workspace or high order thoughts to reference processing. We have one uh, integrated information theory versus uh, predictive coding, you know, all these kind of explicit comparison of theories using experiments where the adversaries in a way agree you know on different uh, on different results different predictions it's very useful and that's also something happening in our field and so i just wanted to share the excitement about all this with you and i'll be very happy to uh, get questions so i want to thank to thank so many people uh Giulio Tononi and Chiara Cirelli uh, Christoph Koch Marcello Massimini also you know of course Stephen Noyes and, and Carl Fristin and Halbum and so I learned so much from them and Right, I hope it was not too much, but I gave you my PDF and also like you can contact me anytime for questions uh, uh, later on to you and I'd be very happy to to debate or get tomatoes now. So <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Bowley. Tomatoes, I don't know, but I'll, I'll get them. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are actually right on time and it's perfect and, and we already have quite a few questions. And so we'll start with uh, Marlene, can you please unmute? Yeah, hi, hi there. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting talk. Thank my you. question is related, of course, to my research, and that is that I, uh, people who are in alcohol blackouts report that they have no memory nor, nor any awareness of the complex kinds of behaviors that they do during the blackout. And these can range from fairly simple tasks like uh, having a conversation with other people to driving long distances even out of state and then checking into a hotel not knowing how they got there uh, or why they were there. These are task relevant behaviors using your terminology 
without conscious awareness of the experience. And I was curious what your own thoughts were about what areas in the brain are silent during an alcoholic blackout. So they, again, uh, they are important methodological, uh, you know, uh, issues to discuss. So basically, we forget most of what we experience. Also during dreams, uh, we forget most of what we experience. If you actually uh, ask someone at the beginning, uh, at the end of the night, yeah, uh, how much they were dreaming, that's the minority of the night. If you, they, you wake them up systematically and ask them, they'll, they'll actually tell you like two thirds or plus of the time, yeah. Uh, it also during epileptic seizures, sometimes you can have complex behaviors and patients don't remember them. And basically there, uh, you're in this kind of cases where you cannot really, uh, if you were taking just the alcohol blackout or just the seizures where they don't remember, you, uh, you are in a case where you cannot really dissociate consciousness from, uh, from memory efficiently. And so there, I would say that it's important to look at other conditions too, yeah? And to look at conditions where you can actually dissociate the two and look at the mechanisms of both. And then from there, infer, you know, from the mechanism of brain activity you have yeah, in, a, in, a, in patients with alcoholic blackout uh, to see what is the most likely, uh, most likely situation. So you cannot test theories in every condition. Yeah. Like say in coma patients, actually, I mean, I started with coma research, I'm still doing it, but coma patients at the individual subject level are not the best to test the theory of consciousness because they cannot talk to you, yeah? So what you try to do is really, you do your homework of also trying to find what we do also with Brian Edlow, we're going to do that TMSCG work, yeah? Do you have some markers that are validated for consciousness in other conditions, yeah? And or like in minimally conscious patients, we know they're conscious. And then you try to infer you know, are they likely to be conscious or not? <laughs> in the cases where you cannot really know. It's a very long conversation, but I'm writing a review about it. And I think that there is a lot. Uh, also, there has been a lot of methodological problems in assessing the links between consciousness and behavior. A part of it is actually because people were uh, uh, using binary reports. So are you conscious or not of a stimulus? And now we know that consciousness is graded. And there's a lot of consciousness. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, more than chance performance that you can find in this kind of glimpse of awareness, but not zero consciousness. Yeah? And so basically, if you look at these studies with consciousness is graded and has been explicitly asked, you know, they, uh, consciousness and behavior go, go a lot together. Also, like in patients uh, with epileptic seizures, I'm doing uh, intracranial recordings, and then the first results we have is if patients are conscious and they can tell you they were conscious, you have nearly no change in, like there's no, nearly no slowing in the EG. Uh, if they were unresponsive and, uh, and, and or like if they were, yeah, if they were unresponsive and they tell you they were unconscious, not, you, uh, you have actually uh, much more uh, slow, slowing in the EG. But if patients were responsive so, and, and then they don't remember, they have a very similar pattern of brain activity as far as we can tell to so patients that actually, you know, were responsive and remember. And we have to understand this more. What I'm saying is, this is why I, like our integrative work is so important because you need to have uh, the best evidence you have for someone to be conscious is that they tell you, you know, they were experiencing something, but sometimes you can trust the reports and sometimes they can be, uh, you know, memory issues and there it's safer to focus on the conditions you can test, yeah, where you can trust the reports. But if you take the report from like, say, take only the reports from at the end of the night, you know, for the whole night or after uh, alcoholic blackout and they don't remember the whole thing, it, it might be less reliable. It's actually known that the reports are actually much more reliable when they're kind of on the moment like this, yeah? That's what I would say. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> it's a complicated answer, uh, but thank you very much. Thank you. And the next question from Dr. Hutchison. Um, hello, thank you uh, very much for uh, <clears throat> an excellent overview talk. This this is not an area of, of my uh, research, but I was just uh, wondering about the role of the claustrum. I thought earlier on Koch had some theories about the role of the claustrum in uh, consciousness. Maybe you could give a quick update on that. And the second part of my question is also uh, a big question about the Nico shift idea of CL. 
and that this is kind of like a sweet spot for stimulating uh, with deep brain stimulation and uh, raising uh, consciousness in minimally conscious state individuals. Just those two things. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, they go together. So the torsum is a subcortical center, kind of closer to the cortex, but highly connected. Christoph Koch has shown beautifully in animal studies, yeah, of mice that this is highly connected to a lot of different brain regions, same like intralaminar thalamus would be, yeah. Um, and basically, you know, these are uh, promising targets for neuromodulation if you have, say, sleep-like activity in the cortex. That's also one of the things we're going to do with Brian Ed, also using TMS to stratify patients in terms of sleep-like dynamics in the cortex and have these then as candidate for you know neuromodulation therapies. The central laminal uh, la central uh, natural thalamus is one of the most uh, natural targets, you know, evidence in animals and all this. Yeah. And the clostrum, basically the, the, the idea for the clostrum and same for the thalamus, there, there is some um, several studies suggesting both that both uh, Clostrum bilateral lesion of the clostrum and bilateral lesions of the thalamus may not abolish consciousness, but it might modulate it. Yeah. But basically, these are promising targets, as I showed. Yeah. Like this kind of stimulation targets we have bring the brainstem and the thalamus together for recovering of consciousness in patients where the substrate is kind of anatomically intact enough to just be awakened. Yeah. So these then are, his idea happening. for the CL stimulation is that it is a functional lesion or is it activating the CL or is it inhibiting the CL? It's sort of a, a debate in the deep brain stimulation literature, which is more what I'm involved in. I believe of what I, I understand of Nico's, uh, you know, his, uh, his, his model is that you have these arousal and also the frontal cortex are both involved in kind of arousal of the rest of the brain, yeah? Okay. And basically modulating these targets, you can help recovery from coma or TBI. Okay, thank you very much. Beautiful talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, and perhaps the last question from uh, Isaiah. Hey, uh, thank you so much. Um, is there something specific about the posterior part of the brain as opposed to the frontal lobes in terms of the organization of the posterior lobes that better fits the integrated information theory? I, I understand removing the frontal lobes as being important goes against the global neuronal workspace, but is there something specific to the organization of the posterior brain that better fits IIT? Yeah, so that's a, you know, a question of organization in the cortex. Basically, uh, like the connectivity, local connectivity even more. So in integrated information theory, uh, integrated information and like how the different pieces of information that each part contribute, simplifying, is actually bound together. Bound together is because they have common input and output. There's a lot of overlap in their connectivity. They are both specialized and overlapping, like a mesh, yeah? And pyramids of grids, like we have in the back of the brain, so this kind of, you know, spread in a topic, some atotopic maps, and on top of that, you have the invariants you know, clicking this kind of pyramid of grids architecture with both specialization and overlap is predicted to be like one of the best thing you can do for integrated information. And in the frontal cortex, as I mentioned, we're not the only one saying it, it might it look like the, uh, there is some wide range connectivity, but, but locally you don't have this kind of, as, uh, at least that's kind of the hypothesis. It looks like you don't have as much of this pyramid of grids, you know, hierarchical kind of organization and more like this kind of frontal uh, basal ganglia, cortical, cortical, uh, cortical, subcortical loops that help in the function as well. Lots of work to be done, but uh, but definitely in the cortical organization, if you look at what people have done in terms of this kind of grid-like structure, map-like structure, most of them are in the back of the brain. Yeah. Thank you so much again, Dr. Bowley, for this great talk. And just for the sake of time, we're going to wrap up. But I'll encourage the people who've asked additional questions to reach out directly to Dr. Bowley's email, if that's okay with her. And again, we want to thank you so much and hope to see you next time in person. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure and honor to be there. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Ciao.